Hey, Frank here. I'm just recording this to uh, tell you that this episode doesn't touch on anything that's happened in America in the past couple of weeks. We recorded it about a month ago, so we don't touch on it. Just letting you know why I don't comment on it. Frank Miroslav here, and this is All Power to the Imagination, and I'm here with Jahed Mormand, and we're talking about markets in the name of socialism. What's up, Jahed? Hi, Frank. Uh, nice to nice to finally hear your voice and talk to you. We've been internet friends for a long uh, time. Yeah, no, uh, I, I do like being internet friends with you. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> <laughs> and now we get to not admonish other people in replies on Twitter to read markets in the name of socialism. I find yeah, ready to can... talk about it. <laughs> yeah, if they can just listen to us and they don't even have to read it. Exactly. All right. The entire book is definitely worth a read. I highly recommend it. But we're going to be focusing on two specific parts. The first is a section dedicated to the Center for the Study of Economic and Social Problems in Italy, CSIS. Basically, um, it was like a neoliberal right-wing think tank in the 70s, I believe, when Mm -hmm. it was founded. But surprise, surprise, this was not your usual neoliberal think tank. It was actually filled with leftists and <laughs> cultural marxists <laughs> kind of i'm not i'm not joking like it kind of was <laughs> yeah totally yeah um, yeah the cool thing about it is that like it's also funny because i was reading it and it's like an extremely relevant region of italy it's the lombardy region right so like that's all you hear about in italy right now and yeah it was populated by i mean you know tongue-in-cheek cultural marxists actual marxists right like they were real yeah. Uh, The whole plan with these doofuses, which, okay, I'm I'm giving it away a little bit. I'm not going to say doofuses. I take it back. But, like, the whole plan was just like, hey, guys, listen, we are rich industrialists in Italy, and this whole communism thing is very scary to us. So, we're going to... Mm create a and you know Ioana Bachman loves use it use loves this term we're going to create a liminal space right <laughs> and uh we're Love going me to some inhabit- liminality <laughs> exactly we're, there's a liminal space between the constructs of market capitalism in the west and state socialism in the east and one of mm-hmm. those is like you know this uh this idea of uh, market socialism or all these other various types of, mar- of not types of Marxism, you know, Marxism and all these things. And so the, the capitalists and industrialists are sitting there like, oh, fuck, this is scary. All the schools are full of radical Marxists. We need to use some of that money from the West. We need to make them not do Marxism. And it's like, right. And this is why it's so interesting. I don't know, I'm, maybe I'm interested in hearing your, 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 take, your, your take on this as well. But like, it's so interesting because like, the way that she talks about it, we in 2020, or at least I, before I looked at this, I just assumed that people at that time were like, oh, there's only two choices. There's the East and there's the West. Yeah. It's Cold War and we're duking it out. And it's like, no, people had like 10 socialisms happening, right? Like how often does yeah, Bachman yeah, use yeah, the term yeah. socialisms, right? And so like there were people sitting there literally like, yeah, worker ownership is a thing and we know because 500 miles away in Yugoslavia <laughs> there's people doing it yeah. right now right so yeah, yeah, yeah. and that kind of shit scared people right they're not just sitting there going like oh uh, we're really scared of Italy becoming Soviet, a Soviet it's like what, are you fucking crazy that's not going to happen they're scared of people realizing that they can do simple things to undermine you right <laughs> so they reached out across the ocean and other places to be like we should have Milton Friedman come give talks here <laughs> Yeah, I do love that, like, you know, the their grand plan for defeating the communists was like, oh, we're just going to educate people, you know, because we've got all, like, the right arguments. Like, I mean, God bless them. Like, I mean, that's that's far more fun than and not as harmful as, you know, getting, like, brown shirts to beat people up or, you know, Very getting, true. like, 
fascist to like conduct terrorist things. So I mean, like, thanks. Um, but yeah, love to make a Robert Anton Wilson reference. But like this sort of thing, like really, it just feels like straight out of like one of his novels. In that both like it it is like this conflict that is completely outside the space of like what the official Cold War sort of narrative mm-hmm. was on both sides, mm-hmm. and also in that like the label you give to something and like the intended purpose of something and the way it actually works are like two completely different things. Because like I remember reading this book for the first time and I was like actually kind of second guessing myself, not because like I you know thought it was bullshit, but actually because like it confirmed all my expectations. It was like, you know, if you asked me how I thought a certain situation would turn out, I would be like, you know, it would happen in this book. And then when like that actually was revealed to be true, I was like, wait, you know, you're not supposed to get like this sort of like accuracy from like political theories. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Um, To use like an awful phrase, like isn't politics supposed to be like the mind killer or whatever? Like, Uh, am I actually reading something into this? Or am I like actually just delusional <laughs> yeah, i still yeah. don't know but um yeah it it it's really fun yeah for sure like, and like and the chase is one i think is where all the a lot of the fun kicked off for me because all the chapters up to that like i think it was chapter five but the ones after that i was just like oh sick revelation sick revelation thing i didn't know wow that's amazing but the chase is one was one where i just i had a lot of fun with it and i think to, to play off of what you just said the the wilson angle for sure like one one example is um so if you had told me that a bunch of right wingers would take like leftist and norm and you know centrist and you know normal like liberal types stu- European liberals obviously but like you know in and yeah. decided that hey they would put them in six to twelve week camps where they teach them about like price theory and market economics and monet- monetary theory and things like that and then like had them calculate supply and demand curves and Walrassian economics and shit like that. Well, of course, some people are going to then question, okay, okay, that's true. I see that there are some laws Mm. here, but it sounds like you're making a lot of deterministic prescriptions off of these laws. Whereas even if we look at some of the things you're saying here, it seems like you need to have institutions that guarantee certain conditions so that these equations can apply, right? And that seems to be, it's really funny to see that play out in real life because the Marxists, like these students, a lot of them went through this program of like right wing, you know, sort of economics. And to some extent, it was like maybe the early days of this type of propaganda, right? Like, and I use propaganda in a pretty neutral term. I found that a lot of people don't, but I just mean like, you know, uh, we producing material with a certain ideological bias and I don't use bias in a bad way either, right? Like it just is, right? Like, like all knowledge has to be biased. Like, (laughs) you know, you, you like can't get rid of like a lens, like, you know, they're just like basic stuff. Anyway, go on. Yeah. And so what I thought was interesting is like, they have this bent and students come in and they're like, but wait a minute. Um, It seems that you need certain institutional guarantees and therefore don't you think the government is necessary? And and these are the the early days of people saying like, no, actually every single thing that the government does would be better if you use market assumptions to inform it. Right. And people are like, Hmm. And then this program started producing Marxists. (laughs) Right. Like, it was pretty funny. <laughs> that was like one of the funniest things where it's like, yeah, of course, if you introduce this to free thinking people who can see all the evidence, I'm not saying you're going to make a Marxism machine, but you're going to make people who look at it and say, well, obviously you're covering up some of the truth here and perhaps I will run with Marxism because some of its things apply a little bit more than yours. Yeah. Right? Or, or, you know, like Proudhonian socialism or whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, because that group wasn't just Marxists, right? Like, that's just going back to, like, the right-wingers going, oh, we're making Marxists because they view yeah. all of socialism as a monolith, right? Where they're just like, yeah. it's state socialism and it's nothing else, <laughs> right? So, yeah, totally. Yeah. That's the thing, right, is that, like, I feel like especially in 2016 and in 2020, like, the post-2016 world, we just yeah. need people to realize that this shit has been around for a long time. And I don't mean throwing theory books at people. I just mean like, even I learned so much from this, looking at it from the perspective of uh, like, okay, a couple of years ago, I read a book called philosophy of economics where um, one of my favorite, my favorite philosophers, Don Ross, I believe his name was, he does a whole thing where he basically says like, what is philosophy of economics? And then he looks at the entire history of neoclassical economics and he talks about how they make assumptions, how they derive knowledge from economics, what their methods are. And what I thought was like 
super interesting about that is that like it showed the like base level assumptions for things that like can be true and then things mm. and then how the, what, what is the epistemology of economics right and so like mm. what you, what is really interesting about Bachman's book in a similar way is that she doesn't directly get into that but she introduces you to ideas like say uh did you know that the core assumptions of neoclassical economics are built on central planning and are built on perfectly yeah. competitive markets. And it's as if perfectly competitive markets is the entire story, right? And then you go to mm. the central planning side and you go, actually, if we run with a few more assumptions, the central planning side of the argument leads to more competitive markets. How did that happen? Isn't that fucking weird? And so it's not that either one of the systems is like, you know, the, the monolith, right? Like the Cold War monolith of capitalism versus communism. It's not that either one of them is the only choice and we have to go with capitalism. Actually, the real thing I took away from it is that institutions are super important. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Basically have, better, you, right? um, have you read um, uh, Why Nations Fail? No, I haven't. I've, I've, but a lot of people have told me to read it, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I want to. Um, I want to at some point, maybe on this podcast, maybe I'll write it as an article. But like, do um, an anarchist reading of that book because, like, that would be super interesting. Uh, do they get into that institutional question a lot? Yeah, no, the, no. The entire premise of the book is like economic growth is um, like predicated on good institutions, basically. <laughs> You know what's so funny about that is I just I went to the Wikipedia article for it and I'm, we're going to talk a lot of shit about this motherfucker, uh, Jeffrey Sachs. Yeah. According to Jeffrey Sachs, yeah. an American economist, the major problem of why nations fail is that it focuses too narrowly on domestic political institutions and ignores other factors such as technological progress and geopolitics. You stupid fuck. How are you, how does this guy walk the planet being this fucking ignorant? Do how does how do domestic political institutions intersect with technological progress, Jeffrey Sachs? What the fuck does that sentence mean? I'm sorry, Frank. I'm really I need to stop reading anything Jeffrey Sachs says. Everything he says fucking tilts me. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, what were we again? Oh, we were just we were riffing on the the, the chases stuff and uh, and right wing propaganda, right? That's like that's a really interesting thing, right? Is that coming back to it? The really interesting point about it for me, one of the many one points, is that we live in this time where people are like conspiracy theories, this COVID, that, and Bill Gates is going to inject me with shit and control me, and it's like, bro, it's just a lot of people with a lot of money who want to act in their class interests. Right, like they have a lot of shots on goal. They have a lot of at bats. Use whatever sport metaphor you want here, and it, eventually one of those is going to look like it works, and then there's going to be riffs yeah. on it, and da 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 da. You get we we live in a society, <laughs> or on one side, and then on the other side you get Thatcher. There is no society, and so you're wondering. You're looking at the American nightmare today, and people are sitting there going like, uh, oh, "I must work. I demand to get out and work." I want to die for my job. And you're like, how does this happen? <laughs> right? And so I thought that was like, a, for me, it was an interesting takeaway from Chase. This is that mm -hmm. there isn't some fucking all powerful central, central planner, ha ha ha, central planner who's sitting there going like, oh, I'm going to make a right wing think tank here and dominate communism. Actually, it did the fucking opposite, yeah. right? Like it was a f abysmal failure. And then other times it's not. And y you have this large probability space, this phase space of probabilities, and some of them yeah, converge. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's right? like, like basically venture propaganda or something. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's a very good term for it. Absolutely. It's venture propaganda. So the Chase's chapter is really good to see. I think a lot of people can understand the venture propaganda idea once you introduce them to the fact that like look uh you got fucking how many 400 billionaires in the world and maybe 10 percent of them are putting like uh, 10 million dollars each per year in a right-wing think tanks and you run out of simulation a few years and you get right-wing propaganda and the entire political spectrum shifts right great but you need to get inside the beast you need to see the ethnography of it to see how it actually works so that you don't sit there thinking there's this massive fucking Rube Goldberg machine that automatically produces reality, right? The fact that like it's this scattershot approach means that it's not perfectly controlled and that mm -hmm. you can rely on the fact that because they're like just taking buckshot approaches to things, you can rely on the fact that, you know, they're not going to be thinking in terms of like second order consequences and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like one second order consequence. Uh, it's not even a second order one. It's just like, I didn't, I didn't intend to make more socialists, but my machine goes burr and makes more socialists. What the fuck? <laughs>
<laughs> Economics education makes more socialists. <laughs> Go for <laughs> crazy. And that's the thing, right? Is actually what you just said is a very good summation of that book. Economic education makes more socialists. That's a thing that is unthinkable to me before I pick up that book, right? And that's the thing, right? Is that in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you had all these really lively conferences, mind share, calculations, methodologies that were all evolving around socialist assumptions, not because socialism or capitalism is better, it's because they worked, right? Like they produced yeah. results. And that's kind of in juice juice. I mean, the good place, even if you don't want to read the book, is to start with the market socialism Wikipedia, where they just walk through like Langian market socialism, the Yugoslavian style market socialism, and why they did it, right? And like you keep hearing both of us maybe saying like, oh, you know, it worked or neoclassical, this and that. The way that she talks about it in the book is really interesting is that like, you had economists of the period, like, you know, post, so you pre chase this, right? If we change the subject a little bit and move earlier in the book, yeah. um, you had economists literally saying, like, you know, in the, in the spirit of the monolith conversation, this is not any fucking Russian socialist or Russian communist who has to do mm. the, um, you know, sacred Marxist Leninist economics, right? This is a person who's doing neoclassical economics. And he's sitting there going, oh, yes my economy produces more things in a more predictable way if I cede control over time to worker cooperatives, if I get, if I make management less, if, if I introduce more actors into the market, how do I do that? Yeah. Oh, I, well, I have, a, I have a machine that goes burr and lets people exit and enter, right? And I call it, and I call it social support, right? So if, if workers can enter and exit markets yeah. with more ease, then that creates more actors. There are more people left to play the game and the market is more competitive and we produce more goods at yep. cheaper prices. Crazy. This is socialism and it works better. Very strange. <laughs> right? So that's, I thought was, maybe that's the next thing we talk about is like, like maybe the Yugoslav experiment or something like that. What do you think? What's on your mind? I just wanted to point out that, um, so Noah Smith, who's, you know, a normal <laughs> liberal, but yes. he, um, there's like a he like wrote a article for Bloomberg, well a couple, um, saying that like as economics becomes more um empirical, it's moving further to the left. Oh, oh my god, Noah Smith said that? Wow. Okay. I have to reevaluate my opinion of Noah Smith. That's very good. Yeah, he's he's that? like he's like a he's like a, you know, Warren technocrat guy, but um I really like reading his stuff on um, you know, the inside baseball of economics because um he like reveals what's going on in the profession. Um, nice. Anyway, yeah, I just thought I'd bring that up. You know, I, I think it makes a lot of sense because, like, especially if you come like a like a Warren technocrat, this book is not kind to Warren technocrats, man. <laughs> like, no. like, no. Uh, like, uh, you know, if you if we jump off of the like the the Hungary experiment, right, is another chapter that she talks about because really the the book, you know, we kind of just jumped right into the right wing propaganda experiment, uh, ethnog <laughs> ethnography, because I thought it was just fascinating to see from the inside in the world how are these people like in the sense of uh if Glenn gillis ever listens to this he's going to give me shit for it but in the sense of uh uh like the heidegger being in the world type shit right which then you know, yeah. created like the albert drive the hubert dreyfus and interactionism and shit in a sense in that sense he's gonna be so pissed I'm like why would you bring up that nazi on this podcast but anyway <laughs> um my point is that like you would you get in really close to what they're actually doing because she's that's what she is she's a sociologist she's a sociologist and she's mm. doing ethnography right so mm. she really yep. she went into the archive she talked she did interviews it's really interesting to see those people do that but then when you zoom back out you know uh, we just jumped into chapter five the book covers um like the uh i forget exactly the order and if you've got the book in front of you frank maybe you can get into that but yeah, I, I do i do oh yeah go ahead man um, okay, so neoclassical economics and socialism from the beginnings to 1953, a new transitional discussion among economists in the 1950s, neoclassical economics and Yugoslavian socialism, goulash communism and neoclassical economics in Hungary, chapter five, which is, you know, the one that we've been doing, market socialism or capitalism, the transnational critique of neoclassical economics uh, and the transitions of 1989 and then post-1989, how transnational socialism became neoliberalism without ceasing to exist. Oh, yeah, yeah. That one is rough. That one makes me sad. Yeah. But you know what? Number one, though, let's, can you, can, number one is a great one. And here's why. Yeah, no. for, for those of us who used to be libertarians, uh, right libertarians, 
me. <laughs> um, that, I, 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 that's also me, by the way. Anyway. Chapter one was really, really great for me because, yeah. okay, from about eight, I'm, I'm 35. So uh, yeah. from about age 19 to 25, I was a right libertarian, but I wasn't like a super thoughtful one. Okay, I read Milton Friedman. I then found Mises. I found, uh, you know, who uh, Henry Hazlitt. I started reading some fucking Thomas Sowell. Uh, not that these people are libertarians. It's libertarians like to point to them for economics in, you know, uh, yep. like the 2000s, whatever, right? And then, like, you know, I found a few others. Uh, I found, ooh, Rockwell. <laughs> but anyway, um, what, what yeah. my point, though, is that, like, these uh, Mises in particular, I spent a lot of time with Ludwig on Mises. And Mises in particular was all about the fucking quote unquote socialist calculation debate and yeah. the, this book my friends who who you know we we've talked about already the right-wing propaganda machine for the chases thing this book is amazing for the shit that bachman finds in piecing together this so-called socialist calculation debate basically mm. she does two things that i love and you know, maybe you can find this my favorite but she does two things i love number one is she says one, from archives of conferences and everything that you can find, this debate never happened. <laughs> it's like it, it literally never happened. The key parts of it were actually happening in the 1910s and the 1920s. It was picked up again by Mises and Hayek. And in like the 40s and 50s, it was fashioned from conference notes. No one really ever decided to retort on the other side because they didn't know mm. what was happening. And then when they did, these guys just stopped doing economics. <laughs> right? And so like, and then she, she like high key, like throws a bunch of shit at them too, when she goes, when they were confronted with this, they just spent the rest of their lives doing philosophy instead of economics. <laughs> and I was like, damn. That was pretty funny. Yeah. Cause she's clearly like, this is an academic, this is an academic insulting someone right here in this book. This is what that is. <laughs> so I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, no, no. My favorite thing um, is like Hayek gets to like England because like I think he's fleeing the Nazis, maybe, and then like he gets to the London School of Economics, and then like he creates like the economic calculation debate as a way to like basically in response to like student Fabian free market socialists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's exactly right. And to me, when I was reading, when I was reading through, I didn't read it twice. I just kind of flipped through it. To me, there were yeah. echoes of that Chase's chapter five there, right? Because like he shows up here and he goes like, "Okay, this isn't good. Everyone's a Lange and market socialist here. This is bullshit. I got to do something about this." And then he tries to, and it's just like it doesn't really go anywhere. <laughs> like as as an yeah. academic for him, right? Like those ideas mathematically they check out. It's just that the right wingers are like, "This is bullshit. We got to stop this." And that's, you know, separate comment. I think it's one of the interesting things of our current time where you like in 2020, people who aren't like um, full-throated right-wingers, right? They, they just yeah. think that you can do things like have, you know, have the facts speak for themselves and shit like that. Or I'm just like, no, 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 man, come on. This guy, uh, if, if Hayek was alive in 2020, like he's walking into this quote unquote debate. If the debate's happening on Twitter, he's walking into it with like, starting from the end and working backwards to how he's going to defend the fact that your point sucks. There's no one sitting yeah. here going like, oh, well, let me start from first principles and see what actually works for a better economy and then make those posts on Twitter. That shit would never happen. Yeah. And it didn't happen in the fucking, it didn't happen in the London School of Economics either. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, like everyone's, everyone's doing motivated reasoning. It's just some people are more aware of it and try to like check themselves. But yeah, for sure, man. And so I thought that was a super interesting chapter, basically, where like she walks us through this completely fake debate. And then she says, now that I've addressed that, I will not be talking about that in this book. I'm actually going to talk to you about all the shit you've never heard about, right? Which is like, what is market socialism? Why is it a part of neoclassical economics? What happened to it, right? And so from there, like, the super interesting thing for me after that was, I don't know about you, but the very interesting thing was just getting into like, the facts of the cases of Hungary yeah. and Yugoslavia. Yeah, yeah, especially because it's just so easy to like just say that the entirety of Eastern Europe was just like one big thing. Yeah, um, and there's no like tension between the individual parts. It's just all subsumed to one will. Mm -hmm. It's it's really annoying, and it makes like definitive statements like really hard. But like history is never ever that simple, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. 
it reminds me of exactly how the American neoliberals came into nineteen post post nineteen eighty nine, right? Like, um, like we'll get back to this, but the fucking the whole thing they did was to come in and be like, okay, one, we haven't really talked to any of you ever, and two, we think all of you are Marxist Leninist economists who don't believe in prices, basically. Mm. So we're yeah. going to teach you how to do that, and Bachman's construction of this like her reconstruction of it of the events is just mm. to me it's just fucking mind-blowing because essentially yeah. she's able to show you with this you know archival ethnographic work that mm. these people came in like i'm talking when i say these people i mean people like jeffrey Sachs and other sort of like economist economists in this milieu of like global development right and they came into yeah. it and they're like okay great so here's the thing you people know nothing about prices or new or new classical economics and when they were talking to Russians, maybe they were right some percentage of the time, maybe, but not even, right? Because people are putting on a fucking act, right? They're, if you're doing ML economics, like you're doing it so your boss doesn't fire you or kill you. You're not fucking doing it because you actually think it's true. Maybe that's true in 5 or 10% of cases. I don't know, right? But like, but when you come out to the other countries, like Yugoslavia, like Hungary, like any, uh, you know, maybe any of the other black countries, and you say this to people, they literally looked at Sachs like he's crazy. They're like, what is he talking about? We haven't done this since the 50s, right? Like we either have worker councils or we have cooperatives. Our economy is 98% not owned by the state or whatever. Like that's not, a, that's not an accurate figure. I'm just throwing it out there, right? Like when they're talking about Yugoslavia, they're like, essentially there were a few restaurants that are privately owned and everything else was started being owned by the state. And then the state rapidly devolved its ownership to cooperatives and to other people, right? Mm. So the whole the, the whole interesting thing being that by the West's lens, that economy is like actually publicly owned, right? Like that's how they were treating it. They're coming in going like, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, 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 your economy is publicly owned. You need to do some competition. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about. We're doing better than you, essentially. Like we have more competition in our markets than you do because we don't have Marxist Leninism <laughs> happening in our economies, right? We don't have a command and control economy. Yeah. I just like really don't want to like idolize these places. Oh, for sure. I, I Absolutely. think, I think, they, I think yeah. they had potential. Like I wrote this in um, my review of the article that I posted on C4SS. I was like, mm -hmm. these places had potential and, you know, maybe they could have developed in a market socialist direction. But let's be real about the fact that, you know, the Eastern Bloc dissolves and like we have these upstart countries be like, yeah, we're, we're actually going to try this. Like, let's be real about the fact that they, you know, would have been coming out of like of still, despite the freedoms they had, still a fairly status context and they would have mm -hmm. had to deal mm -hmm. with like mm -hmm. global capitalism. Of course. I think what happened is absolutely tragic, but I, I don't want to like idolize them. I, I'll be clear too. I'm not saying my opinion of them. I'm saying from their perspective, right? When you're in, especially in the uh, post 1989 yeah. chapter, oh, yeah, they're yeah, totally yeah, yeah, like, yeah. they're totally saying they're like, this yep. man is crazy. What is he talking about? Like, we don't do this. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, and, the, yeah, yeah, and yeah, of yeah. course, and of course the outcomes could have been so much better. Cause you know, we we're talking about the Warren technocrat, um <laughs> comment earlier like <laughs> these people had any chance of actual market socialism being basically just wiped out because people were like no uh obviously i'm not going to do that because i like my job and this would give me no job <laughs> so like a lot of times that you had these like competing incentives where a bureaucrat would just say no we're not going to actually devolve more control to the cooperatives right like it wasn't a utopia for sure but the but the economists who were in those places for sure were like so jeffrey Sachs. He has no idea what we do here, does he? <laughs> like he has no he yeah. has no idea of the yeah. of the conferences we've been to in the last thirty years. We're talking about exactly this, and then the the really I don't know. This kind of broke my heart. At least this guy shows up, and so you would think that for a neoliberal who believes in the free market, you would expect a global market reform of a place that needs global development to take the shape of like, hey, let's introduce market competition. The first thing it did was say give ownership of all of your companies to the state 100%. So do that first. Next, dole it out to managers and budding capitalists who you trust, yeah, right? No. Um, yeah. what? <laughs> right, so you went from 100 so you went from like this weird place that the west can't really see in its own lens, right? Like can't really understand cooperatives. Like sure they have them, but they're just like, "Whoa, oh, what is this? What is this ownership class? I don't get it." And then they went from that to 100% publicly owned so we could basically steal everything in the workers. Second, let's give it to our cronies. So it's not at all a surprise what happened there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Books like this just show just how like utterly just warped our categories are. 
this book um, and like a bunch of other things, but like this book like really pushed me to being like, you know, I don't identify, I'm like trying not to identify with the left anymore. I'm trying to just be like, I am an anarchist because um, mm-hmm. this just shows just how much of a fucking mess the categories were in the 20th century. At some point, you just need to like just start over and clear mm-hmm. away the mess because I, I think people just like don't appreciate just how useful it is to be able to like think clearly about your objectives and the means by which you can reach them. And actually, I think part of that might actually be like the education system and um, our work culture more broadly, where like the actual purpose most of the time is not actually to achieve the stated ends, but it's to like get other things. And if we achieve these stated ends, that's nice, but really a lot more of it is like about control. Yeah. That's a very good, uh, I think that's a very good comparison. I think that's exactly right with rel- relative to the kind of, uh, reforms that were instituted in post-1989 uh, Soviet bloc, right? Is that they were like, yes, we are here to introduce more competition and show you how to operate your economic system because clearly you have failed to be able to do it in the, mm, you know, 72 years you've been here, right? And the way we're going to do it is actually by making you lick this boot. So, yeah. boot is called neoliberalism and you're going to do what it says now. <laughs> like, and it's like, oh, okay, this is actually about control. Got it. <laughs> like, uh, which is kind of the same with work, right? Like, uh, not to take too much of a tangent into it, but like being a person who works in a white collar a job, it's interesting to see the rituals that white collar people do. And mm. I'm now entering my own ethnographer shoes because it's kind of what I do for a living. In technology, I think it's, this is kind of stuff is really, really cut it. I'm using tongue in cheek here, cutting edge, right? <laughs> Where people are like, okay, cool. Uh, how are we going to develop software? And someone will say, well, we should use the agile methodology because it means we will not have to plan. And then all of this stuff devolves into becoming a locus of control for the managers. It's never about actually empowering people as it is. It's instituted as empowering people always. Mm. Uh, we just want you to understand the business context and your customers more closely. We're going to let go of the chains. What ends up happening is strict regimented documentation of every single thing you're doing in a two week period so that you can deliver things in a predictable way for your manager. It's never getting closer to customers so you can understand what they really need, focusing on the most important thing and with freedom and autonomy, which if you read the Agile Manifesto, it's literally fucking right there. Right? It's like people before process and then they, all the other things. Right, So yeah. uh, it's an interesting thing, right? How uh, when, and I'm, I'm going to refer this again, when you say you're going to be an anarchist without adjectives, I think it's a pretty much the point, right? Is that if you have a very specific objective for thwarting these types of relations of power between people, then it gives you a clear lens to be able to say, actually, that's going to lead us towards bullshit. And we're going to be mired in it forever because the fundamental approach to it doesn't address the question of power, right? So, like, I think that's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you're in, like, a conflict between, like, two agents, I think at some point, like, it just becomes non-deterministic, especially if, like, those two agents have a lot of freedom in terms of how they can act. And so, mm-hmm. like, defining yourself by any one strategy is just, like, a bad idea. Yeah. And I think that that's, like, the, one of the key things in the book for me in every chapter is you see you see how much this monolith of capitalism versus communism just did so much damage to everyone's brains. She says two things that I love in this book. Two, two common, commonly used concepts she uses on almost every page is she uses the term, unironically, actually existing socialism. She says it like 20 times, right? And then the other term she uses is socialisms, right? Because, like, mm. she's just trying to lump these things in in a way because, you know, she's... You, when you get into these categories and objectification, you lose so much nuance. And then you have people digging out moats of, uh, that they built intellectual careers around, and you get really far removed from what works, right? So, yeah, that's, yeah, like, one yeah, thing yeah. we really need to take from the 20th century is look at Bachman's book and understand why these two monoliths should be killed so we can all move past them. Because we've known that capitalism has broken for over a hundred years, at least since the time of Marx even, right? Like, so come on. Well, one thing I wanted to say actually on the back of that is that it was interesting to see, uh, it was either the Chase's chapter or the one right after it, um, market socialism or capitalism, which uh, was really interesting because when you ask some of the people in the Eastern Bloc why they don't do Marxism, 
some of them would literally say that Marxism was a theory of capitalism. It was not yeah. a theory of socialism, right? Yeah, and I thought yeah, that was very interesting because I've heard people say that before, but I never really took it earnestly and I didn't really study it myself, right? Like I didn't really go and be like, oh, what does that mean? Because look, I've read Marx through other people. Like I've read Capital is Power. I'm never going to read Capital. I'm sorry. Mm. It's just not happening. <laughs> it's like I'm going to read the 600 page biography of Deruti by, by Abel Paz before I read Marx. It's not happening, mm. right? But the point is that, like people look at it and say, yeah, it's a theory of, of capitalism. We can't do socialism with it. And I think that's a like that's a really important point because it tells you those critiques of capitalism of capitalism have been around for 150 years and why are you still being an MLM on Twitter? Yeah, so for some weird reason, I listen to Marx's podcasts and so I actually know about this stuff. But like Marx like wrote very very few actual prescriptions for what socialism or communism um, was going to look like. Like his most fleshed out thing is um, critique of the Gopher program. And it's, like, incredibly light. It pretty much is just like, oh, you know, we can somehow calculate how much labor time goes into something. And then we can, like, give people labor time notes that they can use to spend on things that are worth equivalent labor time, which has problems. But, like, even then, like, that is such a, like, tiny, small fury of what, you know, like, a post-capitalist society could look like. It is, like... Absolutely absurd. Um, and the fact that, you know, Marxists in any way try to have this claim of being scientific, it, it like, just boggles my mind. <laughs> oh, scientific socialism. Okay. Yeah. So, well, one thing I'll say is, like, the – so, I read Capital's Power and they spend the first mm, three chapters really, really, really digging deeply into Marx, right? Like, they go in and they compute prices – with Marx's assumptions, the term here, and I think you actually said it, but it's socially necessary labor abstract time? labor time. Yes, that's right. Socially necessary abstra- abstract labor time, right? And is the exact is the term that they use the, from Marx, right? Where they're like, okay, so neoclassical economics has the util, Marxism has socially necessarily a, a socially necessary abstract labor time. Great. Let's compute prices with both of them, and also let's recap. Let's let's re-adjudicate the uh, the Cambridge Capital Crisis, which I'm not going to do here. <laughs> We're already at 45 that's, minutes. That's the, like next episode. <laughs> yeah, it'll be next episode. But the point being that both their point is that both systems are built on things that are that can't reel <laughs> in, in the philosophical sense. Right? They cannot even reel. So yeah. uh, and and so the, the the in terms of ontology. So therefore, almost every assumption they make is going to be lossy. And which is true, right? Like, of course, it doesn't matter what system you use, it's going to be true. So it's not like necessarily a super interesting outcome. Where they go with it is more interesting where they go, actually, you get closer to realness if you assume that capital is an abstract measure of control of the ruling class. And then they try to compute that. And it gets much closer to reality, right? And so, like, they're indebted to Marx for pointing out some of the things that empower their conclusions. So, it's not like, you know, for the Marxists listening to this, um, if they ever do, um, it's not that I'm saying that I will I will never read him because I hate him and he's bad. It's I won't read him because I. it's kind of like, what, what, why? Why does it apply in 2020? I don't understand. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's like reading, I don't know, like an alternate theory of relativity or something before Einstein. It's like, that's interesting for, you know, historical purposes. But if you actually want to understand stuff, you go to like the guy. If you want to, you know, for instance, understand market socialism, I think to some extent you've got to be doing market socialism, right? Like it kind of reminds me of that thing that, that Graeber said, um, where that was like one of his key questions for why he does what he does is he's like, you know, for bullshit jobs, right? He was like, one of the questions I want to answer is like, if all of if our jobs are bullshit, why does everyone wake up and do capitalism every day, right? Like you have to take that in good faith, right? You have to be charitable with that assumption. Why do we do capitalism every day if we know it's bad for us? And so, like in that spirit of that, I'm someone is going to hear this and be like, oh, he's just trying to like out anarchist me. I'm really not. I'm just saying like you just have to do more of it, right? <laughs> like, what does it look like? You have to do more of it. Yeah, well, I mean, if you like think- you know, like. <laughs> Like, you know, the, that's not, it's not just like some like hippie bullshit. It's like, no, like there's this thing called like complexity classes and, you know, as systems become more complex, trying to predict them in advance becomes increasingly impossible. And so at some point, the only way you can like actually get knowledge is by doing it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. 
That's the thing. And I'm, that's what I'm coming back to Bachman's book. One of the saddest things about it is that the, in a lot of ways, the legacy of mostly the, the Yugoslav experiment too, you know, obviously the Yugoslav one in retrospect makes a lot of sense why no one really gives a shit about it is because they just write it off with, well, genocide happened afterwards, right? So we can uh, just ignore that. Shit. <laughs> yeah, shit, exactly. But, and like, and like Tito, he wasn't so great, right? Wasn't he a dictator? And it's like, but okay, again, I'm not out here trying to save Tito's reputation. I'm not a Titoist or whatever, right? But uh, what I'm saying is like getting next to the facts of his world as much as you can at the time is interesting because then you can be literally be like, great, okay, what did they actually do? Well, they literally looked at Stalin's Russia and said, that's bad. And can we do better? Then what do they do from there, right? Like that's pretty interesting. And that's what that chapter is basically. <laughs> But yeah, man, so um, we talked about Hungary. Well, we didn't talk about Hungary much. We talked about Yugoslavia. We took we covered Chapter 1 and the interesting shit around how, by the way, new information for everybody, just to repeat it, the socialist calculation debate never really happened. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and <laughs> Just like the moon landing. Important fact. <laughs> and uh, sorry, 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 libertarians. And then you get into the post-1989 stuff I thought was really interesting just because I almost see it like um, there's just a model for this shit now. Like, okay, right, what does everyone remember from post-1989? What I was five, right? But, like, what I remember now, though, when I was in even school, like 12 years later than 13 years after that when I was starting school, uh, it's university, right, is, like, obviously read all the shit like Aristotle, blah, blah, but then, like, we read Fukuyama, right? It's not that there's a conspiracy happening out there. It's just that, like, Again, capitalism, quote unquote, won in this mono, in this battle of two monoliths that actually aren't real. And so, all you remember, right? I feel like this is this is one of the key things, listeners, that you have to take away from this is this is why being anarchist is good, is you have to get at the roots of this shit, right? Like that's the whole point. And when you look at the 20th century, it's just a perfect example of this shit, right? Because you got Fukuyama sitting there going like, well, liberal democratic capitalism is one, and now it's all about finding, ironing out the wrinkles, right? Like, that's what we got to do. And underneath that stupid fucking sentence, in layers and layers underneath, you had people like Jeffrey Sachs and other managers sitting out there going, yeah, cool. Well, what we're actually going to do is we're going to do the complete opposite of liberal democratic. We're going to do capitalism. We're not going to do liberal or democratic, right? We're going to steal your shit. We're going to give it to your managers. We're going to give it to Roman Abramovich. And like, like literally I read that chapter, Frank, and I was like, oh, this is how they created Roman Abramovich. This is how you own Chelsea. Got it. Cool. <laughs> this is how you own Chelsea Football Club, right? Like right, right here. So like, that's like the big takeaway from the 20th century. My friends read Bachman's book and you can really understand why, why, how these people will sit here and say, it should be obvious to many of you as anarchists, right? But they'll say this shit, but there's, it's really just propaganda in order to exert control, in order to go through more levels and just fucking look at the landscape today, right? And I thought that's like the cool thing about Bachman's book is it's an ethnographic account of how that shit happens. And one of the other things that I thought was interesting about that last chapter is, again, even in the post-1989 world, right, you yeah. still had a lot of people fighting against the monolith, right? And what I mean by that is, like, the yeah. only one that was standing after 1989 was the quote-unquote so-called liberal democratic capitalism. But you got a guy like Joseph Stiglitz, mm -hmm. right? Like, the fucking recipient of the Nobel uh, Prize in Economic Sciences is sitting here having a very, very lively debate about the nuances of how we should handle post-1989. And that's another very interesting thing from that post-1989 chapter. He's sitting there talking to uh, Sachs and the other guy. I don't remember. the. There was another guy who was a prominent manager that she, that she cites who also put these stupid policies in play. But uh, Stiglitz, though, was prolific and post-1989 talking like, look, it's almost as if he had just learned about market socialism, right? Like he's literally was like, wait a minute, this happened. Yeah. It's weird. And I don't know if it's good, but we should not pretend it doesn't exist. And we should take it into account when we design our public policies for helping the post-Soviet bloc countries uh, modernize, right? And literally no one listened to him, right? So if you're sitting there going like, well, you're really giving Jeffrey Sachs a raw deal here. Maybe he just didn't know what was happening. No, no, I'm not. Actually, the top people in his field were talking about this. They were publishing it in the top journals. They were meeting in the conferences. They were saying, hey, we should learn from this and do something with it. And everyone was like, actually, I'm going to get buckets of money because 
my right wing, you know, fucking neoliberal <laughs> think tank is design the policy with me and we stand to benefit from it. So fuck you. <laughs> Going back to like the end of history thing. Um, I think, I think like one thing that's kind of interesting is that um, in some ways um, China has a more free market than um, like America in some regards, um, especially like with regards to shit like intellectual mm-hmm. property. And I think it'd be like incredibly ironic and funny and also kind of terrifying if like they ended up overtaking the West, not because, you know, they don't have dysfunctional hierarchical bullshit, but they don't have it in certain mm-hmm. areas. And so like they're not re- restrained by um, bureaucracy in that yeah. regard. Yeah. Plus like they also, if you think about their leverage and you compare it to like say the leverage of a Yugoslavia or Hungarian model, you know, from the from the book. Uh, they're not doing anything at all like that, but they have. But they have some of the levers in in the public policy there, right? Like for instance, I don't look. I don't follow this shit too closely, but once in a while, like my brother who does follow this stuff really closely will tell me, "Hey, they just replaced another CEO, uh, you know, in in Guangzhou for uh, you know some gigantic textile factory that sells two hundred billion dollars worth of the world's clothes, right? <laughs> Whatever, right? Something crazy like that, because." They will do this almost as if they're looking at things like economic game theory, where they're just like, okay, so and so person has far too much power in the system. We're going to replace that CEO. That person's going to be over here, right? And like the, it's almost as if, as if they have like a random number generator where they say, how do we uh, make sure that there aren't too concentrated monopolies in our market? Do you think that that might be end up being <laughs> a little less, a little better? a marginally more competitive market, at least within the borders of what is known as China compared to like the U S <laughs> yeah. And also just like, you know, just like shaking stuff up and like, you know, putting more um, pressures and stuff. And so like, there's more dynamism, mm-hmm. like, and you do that for long enough, like you see returns. Mm-hmm. Although I think, um, I think like under Xi Jinping, it's kind of moving away from technocrats towards, you know, more like politician types who just want to concentrate power. I don't pay attention to China that much. It's, it's just like a thought mm-hmm. I had and um, it kind of unnerves me. But it also, um, also like um, one slight ray of optimism I have is like developing countries might be able to use like some of this mm-hmm. stuff. I wouldn't trust like any like established like first world country to do this, but like a developing country that really wants to sort of punch above its weight um, on the world stage could be like, hey, like this decentralization stuff works and, you know, maybe it'll make us like a weaker state or, you know, maybe not. I don't know. There's like weird stuff there, but whatever. We can use this as a way to like dramatically increase the efficiency of what we have and we can like circumvent these bureaucratic uh, approaches that are clearly mm-hmm. failing. I think there's like something interesting there, even though, you know, like decentralized fascism is a thing. <laughs> At the very least, like it's interesting and it's something that you should yep. keep an eye yep. on. And I think like that's definitely one of the things coming out of the book for me, at least all of these two of them, right? Is that if you look at, well, first, what you just said is already a fact from history that happened, right? Like remember when they covered the non-aligned movement? Mm. Uh, when she covers the online movement, like yeah. so, and I look, I didn't, I didn't dig into her references here. So, like, it, this could be an extensive history, it could be a tiny history. Mm-hmm. But what I thought was super interesting is that um, Yugoslavia led the non-aligned movement after Stalin ejected them from the bloc, right? And so, like, India, giant economy. Uh, mm-hmm. Hungary, a few years later, a uh, number of other countries, some in Africa uh, and some in Latin America, were part of the non-aligned movement, right? And so. Why is that interesting? It's interesting because Tito's Yugoslavia and the the Yugoslavian mathematical economists, the Yugoslavian neoclassical economists would all spend considerable time at the World Bank and the IMF. Now, I'm not trying to fucking, uh, you know, rehabilitate the IMF and the World Bank here. What I am saying is that pre-1989, before they destroyed the entire fucking world and no one would take their money anymore... They were literally doing market socialism. They were publishing about it. They were putting it in their books and they were saying, this would be a good model for developing economies. It seems like it's working. It's doing doing really, really well in Yugoslavia. It's achieving extraordinary growth rates. We should learn from it, right? And so I think that's exactly right, basically. Your, Your implication is spot on because- it can help at least in two ways, right? The first one that comes to mind from the book was um, cooperatives, right? Like if you use policy to say, oh, fuck, I'm sorry that all the anarchists logged off, right? I literally said, if you create policy, 
<laughs> Every single one of them is like, fuck this podcast. But anyway, um, I'm, just, I'm just running with this. I'm just a book, guys. Give me some give me some time here. I swear to God, I'm going to go read some Alfredo Bonanno after this. We'll be yeah. fine. But anyway, but, but, but my point being that like, uh, if you if you make more cooperatives, you give workers more power. You and you, you make a more you almost within a few years are able to create marketplaces inside your own country, obviously that are more competitive. So what does that mean? You're going to be if you literally go to them and you say, okay, we are not going to tell you what the prices are, like the Soviet Union would say. We're not going to tell you that the economy demands this much or whatever. You are only responsible for bringing prices to the market. You figure out how to do it, right? That's literally how they did it, right? They're like, you must bring prices to the market, and then you're going to be a price taker. You're not going to be a price maker. So we didn't talk about this too much, right? But like that, I thought was one of the other interesting things is that what do the venture capitalists of 2020 America think? What does Peter Thiel think, right? When you look at what they say about these things, they are interested in investing in price makers, right? They want price makers. They want monopolies. Mm -hmm. Literally... Yeah. Deal's entire yeah, book, yeah. Zero to One, which I did read, goes, I invest in companies that have a high likelihood of becoming monopolies, right? And so, what kind of fucking capitals? Yeah, yeah. Competition exactly. is losers. Exactly. Um, communist exactly. Peter Thiel. Communist, exactly. Comrade Peter Thiel. So, the point is that this sort of neoliberal capitalism is much more in common with Stalin's Russia than it does with a free market, right? Yeah, and so, yeah. going back to your point about the, the, these yeah. developing countries, that's one of the key things that his, both history and the assumptions of mathematical and neoclassical economists bore out and said, like, yeah, you will be able to inject more competition and that will actually help you generate prices and you might actually be able to have re better resource allocation than a uh, capitalist uh, top-down economy. That was not a uh, – I didn't misword that. I meant that, right? <laughs> so like, and, then the, uh, and then the other thing is that you may be able to support your price takers internationally when they have to deal with neoliberal capitalist competition, right? <laughs> like if you have actually said, great, we've stood up a market in our own place. Now we can actually say we can use public policy. Again, don't log off anarchists, but we can use public policy to literally say, oh, okay, so they're going to – like India, take India for example. Okay. So Syngenta is going to destroy the Indian farmers. Great. Uh, what can we do about that? Well, first of all, step one, don't sign deals with Syngenta and assassinate your politicians if they do. So I didn't say that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not condoning assassination of politicians. That was not a con it's, I'm against violence. The point is you could do that, right? Now, assassinate exactly, words. right? Right, really threatening words on paper, but never threaten their lives. Second, you might actually be able to, in your small country, if you've developed a competitive market, to be able to set aside some amount of money to say, hmm, there's a flood of bullshit saturating my market from Nike. Is there a way that I could support the people who lose their jobs from it to get them back in the market, right, somehow? They don't have to go back into something that's destroying me, but they can go back and do something, right? That was a key thing that these, other, that these, that these economies did is they made exit and entry very easy. Right. And that's not a thing that a lot of economists have a point of view on. They like to call that entrepreneurship, right? But they don't, they don't write a lot about entrepreneurship. But you started to see some facts about entrepreneurship emerge from these market, from these uh, market experiments. So I thought that was super interesting. And I think both of those things could be really fruitful for these, like you said, these developing economies to take away from this book. Yeah. Have you read Kevin Carson's um, Homebrew Industrial uh, I, Revolution? I, I'm actually halfway through it <laughs> as we speak. Yeah, yeah. I, okay, okay. So, the, the I think the very last section is, um, it's like about his analysis. It's like, a, it's like just mm -hmm. a couple of pages, but it's about his analysis applied to the third world. I'm really glad I read it before I read Capital is Power because like Capital is Power is like very theoretic mm -hmm. whereas like Kevin Carson, you know, for better and worse, like the man is like kind of crap with maths and so he just uses like a lot of empirical examples but it's like the same thing. It's like, yeah, you know, like productive technology has made the um, price of things like crash and so there's like the only way that capitalists can survive is just through putting up like barrier mm -hmm. after barrier and, you know, that's like where all this like cost disease and stuff comes from but then, you know, we are are seeing the emergence of like these you know small scale technologies that can on some metrics be more efficient and they're fairly affordable and you know that sort of changes the whole game yep of course you know oh like cheap technology that's really flexible can you know manufacture a lot of things and do a lot of things hmm. like of course developing countries you know would yep. love that shit right
Absolutely, dude. And that, so the homebrew industrial revolution, I started reading it because this sort of approach is super interesting because I, I, I don't officially work with these guys, but I, I love their project and I help out when I can. Um, I think you might have seen me post about them, glia.org, right? You're, you're familiar with those folks? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, for yeah. those who haven't are not familiar with them, I find them super interesting because so first of all, the project um, before COVID was uh, 3D printing stethoscopes, 3D printing autoscopes, so the the, the ear um, examining tool and uh, tourniquets, and they did it in and they do it in Palestine specifically, Palestine and Canada, because the founder is a Palestinian Canadian. Now. Of course, in the post-COVID world, it's a very, very interesting time because you're starting to see the fucking bloodlessness of these market dynamics where it's just like, oh yeah, you didn't know that before COVID, there are fucking hundreds of millions of people who, like you said, have barriers with which they are murdered by healthcare policy, right? Mm -hmm. Now... That scope has mass. That barrier, the scope of that barrier, has massively increased, right? And so Glia is sitting there going, "What can we do about this?" Well, we can print PPE. We can print face shields at ten bucks a pop right now. Print and deliver, right? So they're printing and delivering at ten bucks a pop face shields for every single hospital that asks them, right? So they have already printed tens of thousands. So. When you go and tie that back to the, the home do, homebrew industrial revolution, right? Uh, we don't need to lose this moment after COVID is quote unquote under control, whether or not that ever happens, right? Like you, we need to ride that tide and be like, no, actually this was always killing people. And there's no reason 3M should have a right to this barrier, right? Like we need to destroy that. And I like them because they're literally doing, they're doing, he's doing exactly what Kevin is writing about. Like that's what Carson writes. Like he's, do, he's literally yeah, yeah. doing it. And I told, when I talked to him the first time, I was like, bro, do you know what market insurrection is? Because you're doing it. <laughs> and he was like, no, what is that? I was like, let me, let me introduce yeah. you to a book. <laughs> so I sent him Garson's book, actually. I was like, you need to read yeah. this because you're doing it. <laughs> Again, like going back to my point about just how like the categories that we have are just so useless. It's like the inferential distance between like me and, you know, some like random Marxist Londonist on Twitter who, you know, like is talking about how hot Kim Jong-un <laughs> is, um, his sister. I don't know, like how long would it take me to be like, look, these assumptions that you had, like this big book that you really like written by a bearded guy like 150 years ago, like it's it's all right. You know, pretty good for its time, but there are different <laughs> dynamics at play. How long would it take me to like convince you, hypothetical Marxist Leninist with a uh, fetish for dictators? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Oh, man. <laughs> I think, yeah, on well, that, we'll end it. Yeah, you know, yeah, man. <laughs> and it is one o'clock where I am in Spain, so I'm going to hit the. I am going to hit the sack. <laughs> <laughs>